let's take a look in the suitcase. Mm -hmm. That's a good idea. You ever hear that song? You ever hear that song? A balmy day. In a foggy day. A foggy day in London town. Well, this is a bony day. It's a good idea. A bony day. <laughs> My father's side, his father theoretically came from Germany, a guy by the name of Sternberg, and he was in the, his family was in the restaurant business. He did very well. Unfortunately, he died, and this leaves reason for doubt, he died almost as soon as he was married, very, very young man. My father had, and my grandmother had one baby, a baby girl, and then my father was born shortly after uh, Sternberg died. She was married in the meantime, almost immediately upon his death, to the guy I recognize as my grandfather, David Cohen, who sold clothing in New York City. And I never, or as years went by, I never believed that story. So the story is that what, since the only father you know is named David Cohn, why the devil didn't you change your name? I'm asking my father this, just to, to Otto Cohen. He said, no. He says, I, I wanted to uh, honor my f real father. Well, I have a suspicion that my father's real father, who looked just like him, was my grandpa, David Cohen, my grandmother's second marriage. Never know. Spoke English well. He, as I said, he was a clothing salesman. Why the hell I've gone through life with his name Sternberg? It's easier to write Cohen on a check. So, what the heck. That's probably the earliest memories I know of what my father told me about his youth. On the other hand, my grandmother, and my mother's mother was born in the Russian Pale, at the town Minsk, which was near Pinsk, which changed hands from Russian to Polish to German over and over. My grandmother claimed to me, and she was a little old lady when she was 50, she looks about 100, looked about us. He said to me, there were terrible, terrible winters there, terrible winters especially. I said, what was so terrible about it, Grandma? I'm a little kid. Well, you could, as you walked to your house, you heard the crunch of the snow. And on a not too cold night, the Cossacks would come in down, riding on horses, drunk with vodka, and throw flame bombs, flame torches at us. And I said, that isn't very nice. <laughs> anyway, she, she claimed to me that she spoke five languages. I said, what languages? Is it Polish, Russian, English, Yiddish? maybe four languages, and she possibly did, but she was totally unintelligible in all four of them. I mean, this is, this is it. I love my grandma. She was a gentle woman. She was the mother of my mother and my two aunts, Aunt S and Aunt Lil, and two other children who were both men, my Uncle Ben, whom I was most fond of, and the rascal in the family, Uncle Milt. It wasn't safe if you were a girl doing a cleaning job in a house and you were attracted in about 19 or 20 because sooner or later, Uncle Milt somehow got them into the bedroom. Ben was conservative, a real gentleman. I think Ruth, Ruth was very fond of him. Died very young. And his wife, Aunt Lee, was my oldest living relative. Lee was coincidentally the sister of Gert. They were both Parker girls, the last name being Parker, Orthodox Jews. But the girls were kind of advanced. And where Ben married Lee, Milton married Gert. As it was, the Parker girls had one great capacity, one great talent that I, that I understand now at the age of 77. Both had a capacity to live a long time. Lee must have been in her 90s, and Gert, at this talking right now, which is uh, uh, August of the year 2002, is still alive. I don't know exactly how old Gert is, but I think she's... 91. 91. 
still saucy. She's been legally blind for 20 years, and she still gets around, and she's still sharp. We lived in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Why Bay Ridge? Because the father of these five children, in other words, my grandfather, who never lived to see me born, he did live to see my brother Lenny. The father kept opening businesses and failing. He finally opened a grocery store. Where did he go? To Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, where nobody had ever seen a Jew. But they expected to see a Jew would have a yarmulke, long payers, and all that sort of stuff. Very disappointed, and we were, I was only one or two or three Jewish kids in the entire school, constantly a, a victim of derision, occasionally of being hit by the predominantly Irish depression year uh, neighbors I had, whose fathers invariably at that time were hungry, and like everyone else, blamed their hunger on the Jews. And he used to send the kids out, and what would they do? They'd find some Jew to beat up. And you're talking, you're interviewing one right now. Never liked being in Bay Ridge. Made, made quite a few good, long-time friends. One was Norwegian. My best friend, Louis Garisto, obviously Italian, and Jewish friend, Ira Hirsch. And that's about the word, and a couple of other guys. And then the only contact I really had with Jews since I wasn't Bermistra was the high school I went to. My brother, Lenny, dated a lot of girls when I was a kid. It was a constant victim of me crying about things. I cried when I didn't guess them. I never talked. Never talked a word. I was two years old. I really changed now, haven't I? I was two years old and three, almost four, my mother became frantic. This kid hasn't said anything. Everybody in the whole neighborhood and the whole family said, look at this, Justin, not too bright. Lenny, at one time, uh, came uh, in the house in the middle of the winter and left the door open. Very cold day. My mother said, Lenny, will you please shut the door? It's freezing in here. So uh, Lenny said, what did you say? What did you say? And I said my first word, you heard her, shut the door. And my mother got so excited. The phone went ringing to all her sisters, every friend, every relative. Justin talked. I didn't talk so nicely. I was able to talk, but I didn't have any reason to. I got my diapers changed. I got fed regularly. I had a nice bed, to a crib to sleep. What do I have to talk about? I just watched the world going by. So these are my famous uh, first words. You never recorded in any important history of I am history of America. Brooklyn or Bay Ridge. And this was it. And I also tortured Lenny, who is the dad of Ricky, who's making this film. Lenny brought home a pretty girl once, and I was about uh, 11, which made him 18. 10, I was 10. And in 10 years, something like my grandson Bradley today, I decided that when he brought her into the living room, I'd come running out of the bedroom door behind it, naked. And I ran out and ran around Lenny and the girl, and Lenny was screaming, Ma, which he called her, M.A. Look at him, look at what he's doing, look what he's doing. He was very embarrassed by that. That was my biggest day. That was the only quasi fight I ever had with Lenny. Lenny was placid. We got along, we stayed in the same room. It was an immense room, must have been seven by eight feet, the two of us sleeping together. We shared one bathroom in that two-family house, and the, uh, it was a pretty crowded situation. The other floor contained my cousin Arthur, who was to become my best friend, and his sister Naomi, whom we tortured to. Now let me tell you a little about my father, very interesting things, and some not interesting. He was born Joseph Sternberg, to name him after his father. He did not like the name Joseph. He got, and he hated it, even though that was his theoretical father's name, and he went about to change it to Otto, O-T-T-O, on the grounds that you can spell it backwards and forwards the same way. Everybody knew him as Otto, and he was uh, a hustling guy in the docks of Hoboken, New Jersey. He used to, as a kid of, in his low teens, 
would do what they called crack baggage. Baggage. And this is what he did. They waited at the docks because the immigrants would come there. They'd come with wagons. The immigrants would throw their clothing into it, and they would sit in front of the wagons, and they ran through the streets like rickshaws in China, delivering the immigrants to the place in New Jersey they had to go to. Me and my father was fast of foot, very skinny, very tall. A little bad part was that these poor stupid immigrants, he would go right past there, the house they wanted to go 10 times, making the trip look like two, half an hour, two hour trip, until he collected a lot of money. By the time he was 15, he had enough money to open a store, wholesale stationery, and it had a pompous ass name, New Jersey Merchandise. <laughs> Wasn't that um, a good name? <laughs> Now, you're very aggressive, wonderful at mathematics, as was Ricky's dad, Lenny. And could, I'm jumping this in, but my father could add four and five figure columns mentally, immediately. 22,687, and we wouldn't need a calculator. Good at that. Very good at anything connected with math, and very sharp. Uh, Came his age of 18, his store was thoroughly good. It had 20 people working for him when he was 18, <coughs> including his brother, Max, one of uh, three brothers he had. And uh, when he, all of a sudden, he wound up, I don't remember how, whether he was drafted or what, wound up in the Navy. But the Navy was stationed in Hoboken, right near his home and his business in Hoboken. And Max took over the business and was able to run it right into the ground by stealing for it. And my father made more money by opening on the battleship he was stationed on, which never left port, never went into combat. On that ship, he started a crap game, which went on interminably every week. It was his dice. And therefore, as he told me many years later, he said, those dopeys figure, I got the dice, I'm running the game. As a runner of the game, I took 10% of all the proceedings. They went $100, I got a $10 bill. I made so much money, I knew what the hell to do with it. He was a hustler. My father had two brothers, Max, who ran the store when he went in the Navy, and another brother, Louis. Louis got a job as a chauffeur, and uh, the what's his name? The guy he got the job for was the mafioso leader, Frank Costello. Even at that day, didn't make difference. Your name was Louis Cohn. They didn't care. The Italians and Jews always got together somehow. I don't know what. My father booked fights. He claimed with Frank Sinatra Jr. when he was in his teens, amateur fights, which he collected. He was really a hustler. Whatever happened to the business? Max robbed it blind, pretty much, and, and, it and he couldn't catch it. And somehow my father forgave him. He said he didn't do it right. He wasn't running it right, either making the wrong change, not buying the right merchants. It was right in downtown Hoboken. I think he employed about, as I said, 20 people, um, and he was just a kid. So what did he do from that point? One of the products he bought in the stationery store were briefcases. So he went over to the briefcase manufacturer because, you know, I don't own a store anymore. Can I represent you out in the road as a salesman? So the guy said, sure. And as he went into stores, which were luggage stores, they also needed luggage, right? Ladies' luggage, men's two-suiters, uh, wallets. What else? Uh, so he took on line after line until he was representing seven people on a commission basis. During the Depression years, which followed after that, he made a, what was called a very good living. He averaged $200 a week. We were able to have anything we wanted. The, the Lenny and I didn't ask for anything. The one thing he wouldn't do is pay for Lenny's t tuition at Bucknell. He didn't talk much about his youth. When he was in his 50s, I was in Ho uh, Jersey City with him one day. A woman walked over and said, Otto Sternberg. And she said, knowing that now that he was my father, I was about 21 working for him then. Uh, do you know your father was the smartest kid in grade school? He was a mathematical genius. And every subject he got straight A's. I never knew that. He never went, never went to high school. 
He could have. He just was smart at math and anything. And what he was. Where did he drop out? Yeah, he graduated from grade school. This business of representing seven manufacturers uh, won him uh, many years later, when I was 18 years old, no, 20, getting married to Ruth. Uh, my father told Julie, Ruth's dad, that he had seven factories. Sure, he had seven factories, but he didn't own one of them. He represented a wallet guy, a trunk guy, and the so that you're was following in his footsteps in that. Yeah, <laughs> yes, I am a master in. Uh, you know what a BS degree is? Uh, <laughs> I claim I only have three factories. So at any rate, he was also sensational. I'm going to talk about my mother later. Some interesting okay. things. Sensational pinochle player, and year after year. He would go down to Florida, and he never went in the water. He went down for two months in the best hotels in Miami. Oh, he's a two of them. I said, how can you do this? He's making 200 a week. He took off at least the two months a year as a salesman and still didn't seem to be suffering from lack of money. Just before he died, about six months, he said, I got to tell you, I used to go down to Florida, and I would take... $2,000 with me, because that was going to be the bill for my stay. I played games, I played a pinochle with these guys, and they were all terrible players. At the end of the two months, if he came back with more money, he went down two or $4,000 he came back with, saying thus, in other words, these guys that played with him always lost. He said they would have been much smarter when we first started in the season, instead of playing with me, just hand it over the money to me. Because pinochle, unlike poker, is a game where a good, a good player can control the situation. Bluffing, a little bit like bridge, I guess. Very complicated game. My mother, on the other hand, played poker and always lost. In fact, people would say, does your wife work? He'd say, yes, she's a chemist. She turns money into dreck. <laughs> well, everybody's got their own stick, their own, their own talents, you know. And she did. She bought a million fur coats and jewelry and all sorts of things. Uh, her jeweler survived on all. Her business alone kept the jeweler rich. Pop was the richest of all the brothers-in-law of all the citizens. He was known to be the richest. Unfortunately, after the war, his business as a job of luggage, died and died, as he started importing luggage and kicking out the American manufacturers. And uh, when he finally came to pass away around 80 and so forth, my brother Lenny and I had to pick up the funeral tab for the richest man in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Died penniless. Yeah, they never had a fight. My mother and father got along marvelous. It was a perfect marriage, even though my mother blew up like a Zeppelin. And I used to say, she's going to have a heart attack, Dad. We get her to a diet doctor. He would ask me, she's a very sweet woman. <laughs> I said, that's not a logical response. What are you talking about? She's overweight. She eventually lived very long for one woman who never ate. That's what she claimed, she never ate. The boxes of candy disappeared in our house. They were always wrapped with a ribbon, barracini or loft candy, whatever it was called, always wrapped up. But at night, she would tiptoe and, and, and open the candy, eat the candy up, and then tie it up again. Ricky does the same thing. I, this is terrible. We all inherit certain talents. She was a member of one of the first women corps in any army in the world in America. That was World War I. She had a uniform, and she marched around, and I what the hell she did. She was skinny at the time. I still have pictures of her. Uh, she claimed she weighed 90 pounds when she was married, but before she died, she weighed well over 300. She claimed she played basketball, was the only five-foot basketball player I ever heard of. Who knows? Her marriage was extremely happy. They were extremely compatible. I have never heard them, I never in my life, heard, did you, Ruth, heard them hollering or not being affectionate. It was a very good example for, for me and my brother, who also, I don't think that Lenny ever had fights with Shirley. He never had them with me. 
except for the time that I tortured him running around naked, little things like running around naked or, or you know, just talking. We, we really got along perfectly. At camp, he was a counselor at the camp I went to. Mom was born in Brooklyn, but she got a job in the first movie studio in America, in Fort Lee, New Jersey, right across. They took a ferry from New York and so forth. Vitaphone. Vitagraph. Vitagraph. You got it. That's at Vitagraph. The, the owner uh, of the company was uh, by the name of Joe Brady, B-R-A-D-Y. And his daughter, Alice, worked about that. And she was very famous for being in the first really full length. Uh, it was still a silent picture about the fire, the Chicago fire. With Mrs. O'Leary with the cow kicking over the stuff, you know, the fire. Coincidentally, before she met my father, by the name of Joseph Von, V-O-N, Sternberg. You never heard that, did you? And Joseph Von Sternberg was a, pretended, he was a nobleman from Germany. And actually, he was a Jew born in Brooklyn. Went over to Germany and became infatuate, infatuated by a hefty but beautiful and sexy girl. And he said, you're coming to America. She was working in the movies there, and you're going to make millions. So he brought her back to New York, where she made a movie or two and became one of the great stars of all history. Her name was Mylo, um, uh, Marlena Dietrich. And he, he and the Joe Brady tried to persuade my mother, who evidently was uh, very pretty then, to move to the new town they were all moving to where you could make movies 12 months a year, and that was Hollywood, California. She went back, she lived with my gran grandma and grandpa. She said, Dad, and this story is given to me by my mother, I want to go to California. Joe Brady wants me to go there. Maybe I'll be a movie actress. He said, no way. That is a city of sin. And she was very frustrated. Came back and they eventually closed down. And she had been around when all the early silent film actors would drop in. She was very much show business oriented. My mother schlepped me to every show, every stage show of importance on Broadway. She schlepped me to the debut of a young 17-year-old stand-up comic. And she almost fell over, and I almost fell out of the seats. He was so funny. His name was Milton Berle. His mother sat in the audience, and when nobody laughed, he would go, Mama, Mama. And she'd go, oh, hello, Milton. <laughs> Very funny. We just, I mean, I loved it. She dragged him a little punk, and she's taking me into New York. So one time, she brought me into New York where we always ate in one of the automats uh, for lunch. And I might have been eight or nine. She was always, we were always going in the subway and uh, always uh, going to Broadway shows. And as well as that vaudeville, the brainy, the vaudeville dragged me in. She loved live vaudeville. You know, Ruthie, there was that actor that she introduced to me in the order of Marx. Oh, Groucho Marx, the Marx brothers, had also a mother who pushed him into show business. And one day we're sitting in the order rack, and she said, see that guy over there on that table? And I says, yeah. What about him? He said, that guy is Sheehan, of the act Gallagher and Sheehan, two Irishmen. And he said, only his name was Sheehan, and he was Jewish. And he is Minnie Marks, the mother of the four Marks, is her brother whose name wasn't she, and, and which is something uh, else that slips you, I remember. And what so naturally, I had to get up in the middle of eating a sandwich, walk over with her, where she, who never saw him but on the stage, introduced me to him. And she was not shy, but it was, it was great. It was a great learning experience for me, and I became an instant American. I started to actually feel, I started to read history, I was so proud of showbiz. Then I started to hear, when I was just about in the early teens, about the mu musical p gift that our people have given to this country. 
in terms of Jerome Kern and, you know, Roger and Hart and the, Ger the Gershwin brothers and go down the line. There were only two that weren't Jewish. Irving Berlin, the son of a Polish rabbi, the first composer to ever make a million dollars a year. And uh, in, no, no answer name. Yip Hart, Harburg, the lyricist for uh, um, um, you have to see the river, the Wizard of Oz. And I met, I met, met a lot of these people. I saw them at the Y. I saw a Jonathan Schwartz, a disc jockey's father, named Schwartz, who wrote "Dancing in the Dark" with Howard Dietz, who wrote the lyrics uh, for "Wizard of Oz," along with uh, the guy. Uh, I'll think of it some other time. He wrote the music who was also a Jewish something, but there were a couple of non-Jews who were perfectly assimilated into the musical field. One was Harry Warren, who wrote September in the Rain, about 10,000 movies, uh, musical comedies with uh, like 42nd Street, which has been not revised, you know, here, those feet, those dancing feet. Yeah, I've been you, I'm taking two places. I loved Harry Warren, he's an Italian. I know what he was doing there. His name was not Warren, he had a long Italian name made so much money that he bought, took all his family from Brooklyn, 20 cousins, uncles, aunts, brothers, and sisters, and moved them into Hollywood, into an immense house where they lived until he died. In other words, he was like the grandfather of all these people. Very nice man, had terrible fights with Irving Berlin. This is digressing from my own life, but this is all part of the thing, things I love. Hated Irving Berlin because Irving was a, a better composer and Irving wrote his own lyrics. Strangely enough, a man who couldn't, like Harry, play the piano, couldn't play a note, couldn't read a note, but he knew when to make the guy write over the same thing 20 times until his ear was satisfied. And Irving Berlin did more, like White Christian, more, much more movies than Harry won. He hated him. And Harry said one time, we don't talk to one another. I don't like him. He's like a competitor and he's nasty. He's not friendly not encouraging and a week later it came out that the part of the air corps bombed berlin in germany during the war and harry went around telling everybody they bombed the wrong berlin <laughs> i've heard that story <laughs> irving only wrote two thousand songs including amazingly duets for a guy who couldn't write uh write the music down perfect duets like i i love a piano Piano had to fit into two syllables. It wasn't piano, it was a piano. Piano, like P-Y-A-N-O. And also, uh, when Irving got old, like 60, his show came out, uh, Call Me Madam, and Ruth and I were gonna buy tickets. I said my famous word. He's 60 years old, he can't write anymore, he's too old. I was 30 at the time. Russia. And they were born in Poland, Russia, Russia border. I never, he died before I was born. Your father knew this grandfather, but I didn't. Pleurisy, they said he had when he was in the army, your father. I, I always heard TV. But anyway. Yeah. He did okay, have so. TV, but Grandma never wanted to admit it. His mother. That's right. So she That's right. Pleurisy. That's really? right. She told everybody a lie. Really? Typical of my mother when she covered up. Anyway, she. Went to a dance in Hoboken one time, my mother. What was the flapper thing? Well, a flapper was a woman who could dance and do all the Charleston and things like that. It was kind of, I wouldn't say free love, but much more um, related to a sexual creature than the demure women of the 1910s. In other words, right after World War I, everything exploded. Songs signified why. Uh, how you gonna keep them down on the farm? 
After they've seen Perry, well, they saw Perry and they saw this and they came back and they started chasing women because they figured like Parisian women are all cha chasing each other. The men are chasing them. But my mother was uh, a pretty uh, excellent dancer before she got too heavy to be fast footed. And uh, they met at a dance in, I think in Hoboken or Jersey City, which was the adjacent town. And uh, she got married a little bit shortly after that. One time my father uh, told a friend of his, look, I'm breaking up with this other girl. I met, I met uh, Roz uh, Feilson, I'm breaking up with her. Just please, when you see her, just tell her I died. I don't want a calling, I don't want a waiting. The guy says, all right, Otto, if you're, that's what you want. Sure enough, sure enough, the girl walks into the dance hall where my father was prevalent, and what does she see? The dead man dancing, where she, she just went about and fainted. My father ran out of the room, that's it. My mother and father went one cups. And one, I got to move the clock ahead. Interestingly, while they were dancing, they got big cups, and they were made of silver-plated lead. And one day, Arthur and I were searching around for something to melt into forming lead soldiers that we made down in the basement. We had casts for them, and you melted them on a stove and then poured them in. We couldn't find a damn thing. Then we found this cup, this immense cup, and we didn't know what it was, we didn't care. And we scratched it, as Arthur was more of a mechanic, scratched it, he said, this isn't, this isn't silver, this is like a lead. I said, wait, we can melt it. Went upstairs to the kitchen, took a big pot, we melted the whole damn cup. We made hundreds of lead soldiers, until we found out at night about what we had melted. And my mother was really, really upset about it. Were you punished? Nah. <laughs> Look, there were two people in my life, my mother, my father, and my brother. No time did my mother ever hit me. No time did my father ever hit me. And Lenny would have liked to, but he was afraid he'd get held from the pants. He was justified. <laughs> but uh, no, we, I really had a good childhood. Save for being beat up now and then by the enemy in the streets, uh, we had no problem, family problem. And being a rather rich kid, we were down in Florida every year, by the way, was mentioning by car, before the advent, I don't think I could have flown down, right? It went by boat or by car. We, by, train, they by train. And when we went by car, we traveled along in his Buicks, really all the way down to, to Miami at 60 miles an hour. In those days, I'm talking about 1935 or so. And uh, every time a cop would pull us over, I had to go through my act. This precursed the days of our grandson Bradley. What was my act? <laughs> it's getting the back seat and crying my eyes out. Well, I could raise tears. I belonged on the stage, and there's one left 10 minutes ago. No, I belonged on the stage, and I'd cry. The cop would come over and say, What's the matter? He says, Well, my son, my son is very sick, and I've got to get him to a hospital. I'm like, well, keep the speed down, he says. Go ahead. Never once did any of these stupid cops ever say, what hospital? <laughs> when you're in Georgia or South Carolina, what hospital? We went all over by car. We went to Lakewood. Uh, we went to Boston to visit cousins of them. A very impatient kid, nervous and patient, skinny as a rail. And we were going up to Boston and it was freezing and we had no heaters in the car. It was like, just freezing, we had no blanket, we just sat there shivering. 15 minutes after we left the house, I fell asleep. Ten minutes later, I woke up, and my question from Brooklyn is, are we there yet? And of course, Lenny and my father and mother thought that was the funniest thing they'd ever heard since the Marx brother. Uh, naturally, if you're going by car to Florida, you have to stop to eat. In, in South Carolina, I'm looking for a restaurant, and we found one. And the four of us went in, and we sat on the counter, and my father ordered soup. And the chef, or owner, went in the back, waiting five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and my father said, hey, what happened to this guy? And then he hears in the back, <laughs> let's get out of here. 
That son of a bitch is coughing in my soup. <laughs> and she remembers everything. She's got some brain. Between my muscles and her brain, she make a good cover. It was so, even I at the time, I, th I said, no, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. You know, I was always hungry, uh, skinny but hungry. So that was uh, typical of him. People taking advantage of him. Nobody ever really was able to. Uh, he was funny, but toward the end of his life, he would forget, he would tell jokes in a terrible way when my mother was a wonderful uh, teller of stories and jokes, very capable. And in the middle of the joke, he'd start to lose it because he forgot how the damn joke ended, usually having this short-term memory that I discussed. And he, say, he said, then the two guys, and one of, them, one of them said to the other, uh, but, I don't know, I forget the ending. My mother would pipe up something Adam always loved. I'm so glad when he forgets. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, as you know, when I was 12 and 11 and 12, a very, very skinny kid for two reasons. One, I was outside playing all the time. Two is we sat around with the pot in the middle that we were eating, and Lenny and my father and mother were quicker to get the food than I, so I never had much to eat. It was like a race to see who could get it. It wasn't served to our, our plate, but in the main serving dish. And my, I was not fast enough with the spoon or the fork. So I was very skinny, and my mother uh, had never had a doctor for me. I didn't know why I was born with a midwife, because it just not, it wasn't discussed. But all of a sudden, one day, she said to me, Justin, I'm going to have a doctor come in the house. I said, but you know, I was born with a doctor. I don't know why at the time what happened to her that made her hate and fear doctors. So a doctor came to the house and looked at, the, looked at me, weighed me, and said, this, this kid is uh, overly thin. And he's nervous and edgy and jumpy. And my mother said, sure, he wants to get out on the street again, get on his roller, roller skates or the bicycle or something, play Ringo Levio. So he said, what do you suggest? He said, get him a sedentary habit. The doctor left, and I asked my mother, what does that mean? And he said, it means I should get a hobby or something where I sit still. So I said, OK. Uh, how about playing a musical instrument? Because so I used to play my, my aunt Arthur's mother, Aunt Dessa's uh, piano upstairs. She had a piano that I think was 2,000 years old. But it was still enough in tune I could pick out melodies without any effort. I had that, that good in the air. And, uh, so my father said, OK, and he came home. What do you want to do? My mother said, take a violin. My father said, nowhere, no how, am I going to listen to you squeaking on a violin? So he said, your mother's sisters played the violin, and it was terrible when I went, went to court her, take her out the squeaking. It was terrible. So I said, well, then get me a piano. He said, no piano. Cost too much. So I got back to him that day or day later. I says, I can get a new, we can get a new piano, an upright, called a spinet, called Krakow, for $200. He says, I'll buy it on one condition, that you promise me, and I, by the way, I never lied. If I made a promise, it was like gold, that you will practice. So I said, not only, I will practice at least a half an hour a day. So he bought the piano. I so loved taking, I was taking classical lessons from a Swedish woman who was a, was a grand pupil of Edvard Grieg of Norway. And she was a wonderful teacher, taught me chords, which I later on used for popular music. But I was studying Chopin and Beethoven, people like that. I loved it so that I didn't practice a half an hour a day. I got on the, right after dinner, I looked at my clock and I played four hours a day until the neighbors literally were banging an attached house. The neighbors and Aunt Des upstairs, ah, oh, get this kid from the piano. Can't do it. Well, they complained and everything else, so what I did was I got what's called a practice piano. It made no music at all. It was just a keyboard and springs. 
So it had a tight resistance to build up your, your fingers. Of course, I was a skinny runt. I practiced my skills on that for two hours. The other music I'd stop at nine o'clock because they were complaining that they could hear through the walls, through the ceilings. I played lo loud. By the time I played two and a half years, there was nothing more to teach me. And uh, by the time I was 17 or 16, I was playing in a band and then went up to the Mount Catskill Mountain and played in a band. I just loved it. So uh, did you support yourself? Were you making money that way? No, we made $10 a week. And after the third week in the hotel, there were four of us called the Four Notes. I painted the, the, the bandstands. I said the Four Notes. And I was a pretty good artist. And we, we, we said we're going to quit. We were asking for a raise. We're not getting paid enough. The guy said, what do you want? He says, seven, I, we said, $17 a week per man. The owner of the, of the hotel, which is a little cocker hotel, said, no way, go home. There's a million guys can get your job. So we decided to drop our pride, because there were girls that came up in the weekend. It was very nice to see them. And, uh, and the piano paid off a little bit. We had a lot of fun. The next year, I was in the Army. The hotel uh, I, I worked for was a tiny hotel which contained nothing but Jewish refugees or people who spoke a little English, but mostly Yiddish. And the four of us, none of us spoke Yiddish. Since I played the piano, the master, the master of ceremony at the hotel in what we called in those days a casino, it was like the hall at night, by the name of Kanapov. He had written one song, a Jewish song, which made a lot of money from a stupid song. His English was heinous. And the song was called, Oi, I Like She. So you get some idea of his English, but he liked she, and it was a big hit. Oh, I, I like she, I like she, like they like she, I like her hair, I like what she wears. A crazy song. It's Canapor. And since the comedy was in Yiddish, and I didn't understand it, he had to cue me in. So he couldn't cue me. He never said anything. And here I am sitting talking, talking to all little girls that hung hung around the piano. I'm really bored with that stupid show that they're laughing at in Yiddish. And then you'd hear over the whole casino the following words. Mr. Piano Player! And then I started to pump up the piano. Hammerstein wrote Chobo, right? great show, these sort of things. And one of Hammerstein's good friends was a British writer, P.G. Wodehouse. You might know what it was, about a butler yeah, and things, sure. very friend. And P.G. said to um, Hammerstein, ah, any idiot can write a lyric. He says, so did he I think? He says, yeah, well write one to this. And then they played and he wrote this, can't help loving that man of mine. Yeah. Both of us wrote it. I'm still in show book.
high school, uh, I took French one. And because I hated the teacher, Mr. Baum, I sat in the back of the room and ate my lunch there, which was the next period. And the reason I like to eat in the French class, because I didn't listen to the bum, I didn't like him. And when we got to the lunchroom, we got plates, paper plates, and we used to scale them across the paper plates. And of course, doing that a lot, I, uh, the gym teachers used to force us to do two hours of calisthenics when they caught the guys that started the trouble. I was so wiry and strong, we used to laugh. The gym teacher, in order to do calisthenics, also had to do every move. Hands up here, huh? so he was absolutely exhausted. At any rate, back in the French class, I kept hearing a lot of little girls talking, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking about it, and all of a sudden somebody says, and probably Mr. Bain, Ruth Lowenthal, do you know the past tense of the verb to go? And she stood up, and I didn't see her. All I saw was brown hair, and she said, uh, yes, and proceeded to, to say L.A. and those things in past tense and sat down. I noticed, gee, this girl is the only girl in the class that has a soft, modulated voice. The other kids were just approaching uh, female puberty, and they squeaked, I'd love to hear that voice, but I never met the girl. Okay. Uh, after about five times this happening, I got very annoyed because at the ring of the bell, she, in the first row, ran out into the hall, she had another class, and by the time I got to say, I never got a look at her. So finally I arranged it with somebody. I knew what class she was taking. I looked inside and I looked at her and I thought, boy, this is the sweetest, most beautiful girl I've ever seen. In school, certainly, anyway, I, off the screen. I got to meet her. And I asked around and I find a girl by the name of Minor Kriftia, a terrible name, was one of her close friends. And I had Minor in some other class. I went over to her, I said, he your friend of Ruthie Lowenthal. I, I would like to get to meet her. So she says, it's funny you should ask. I'm having a party at my apartment. I live across the street virtually from Ruth. And I'll invite you there, and I'll invite Ruth there amongst the other kids, you get to know her. Well, not being at all shy, I never suffered from that. I guess Bradley has gotten some of that temperament. Uh, I went over to Ruth, talked to her, explained I was in Bame's class with her, she never even realized, and made a date. And my, my, it was very hard to make a date because she had so many of them. And these were mild dates. These are not the times like today where they use that euphemistic noun a relationship. We didn't have relationships. We went out on dates, and if we got a kiss, we did terrific. And so I made a date with her, and the reason I couldn't make this date for several weeks was that she had dates with about seven other guys, most of whom, like me, were kind of tough either on a football team or, like I was, on a wrestling team. And I was tougher than most of them. On the wrestling team, after this date, I realized she was going out with uh, a guy, Ira Wasserberg, who simply adored her, and a couple, Jake Greenberg, and a few other guys who dated her and adored her. And they were on my team. Got him aside and said, look, I'm going to make a date with Ruth Lowenthal. I want to tell you something. I don't care what you do with the team. You ever ask her out for another date, I'm going to break your ass. Because I really was very serious about her. I you even dated her? I just took it to we have that hot chocolate. And, 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 and that was our big day. We had a hot chocolate for a nickel a piece near the movie theater. I wanted to go to the movies, but she was booked. Like, a, like an important star, she was booked up. So they figured it's not worth getting into trouble to start up with him because he's crazy and he is pretty wiry and strong. So here I am getting 14, played in the band uh, because I wasn't a good team player on anything. And Ira didn't listen to me, and I twisted his arm in a wrestling match and almost killed him. So he said, he's going to get even with me. You all the cock ahead. The war came, I went in the army, we communicated. He wrote charming and funny letters back and forth to me. 
I met a million girls in the army, uh, and uh, one of them, who I really liked, uh, had been married at the old age of 15 and was divorced. Her name was Mary Ruth Gentry, the one I told you about previously with the father with a gun on the table. And Mary Ruth and I became very close. She had the audacity to steal from my pants pocket one night my wallet. And in the wallet, I found this out later, she found my home address and sent a letter to my mother, which I found about pretty quickly on the telephone. The letter said essentially, uh, I'm in love with your son, Justin. We want to get married. Though I'm not Jewish, I'm like Ruth in the Bible. Mind you, her name was Mary Ruth. Thy people shall be my people. And she quoted all sorts of idiotic nonsense. My mother hears this, reads this letter, and I get a telephone call. That's how I found out about it. He was panting on the phone. What are you doing? What, what, who is this girl? I said, what are you, how do you know her? Well, how do you have any relation with Mary Ruth? He said, well, see, I got a letter. What about Ruth Lowenthal? I said, what about her? He said, well, I thought you were sort of serious about her, and I was 19 or 20 this summer. I says, I am. But I'm not serious with Mary Ruth. She just took it for granted that I was going to marry her. And anyway, next thing I know, Ruth calls me up and she says, your, your, Ruth wrote me and said, your mother uh, called me on the phone and said she had something for me and it turned out to be a friendship ring. And then we talked, we wrote back and forth further things and uh, I realized that my mother was trying to thwart off Mary Ruth Gentry and announced that Justin, when he came back, was willing to go steady or get married to Ruth. So she, your mother, gave a friendship ring to Ruth. Isn't this a pisser? <laughs> no, I didn't care. Ruth, uh, the war was over and I was stationed. Before you could discharge anybody, it took weeks and weeks. It had 16 million people to discharge between the Army, Navy, the Marines, the, and the uh, Air Corps, and the Coast Guard, and God knows what else. And was went very slowly, and uh, I, I got myself out of uh, Florida. It was much too hot by volunteering to play in a band. They needed a musician in Biloxi, Mississippi, and the captain came over and said, "We need a musician in Biloxi, Mississippi. Do you play anything besides piano?" Because they knew it. I said, "Well." I do play a little, and then in the country, what to say, French horn. He said, really? He says, it's a funny thing. But we were in Boca Raton, by the way, with Tone. There's a, guy, there, there's a band in Biloxi that needs a French horn player. I said, all right, I'm willing to pack up and go there. Troop movement of one. I get there, and I couldn't run away because they would have captured me for deserting. And I reported in this immense camp, I had to go around and around in circles with the bus till they found this particular band. It must have been at the camp, 150,000 GIs. Unreal. Get to the band and an old guy comes out. He says, uh, oh, you're the guy they sent over from Boca Raton. I said, yes, my name is Justin Sternberg. He said, uh, you're the French horn player we need badly. And I had only learned to play a scale on two days before I went out. You ever heard this story? No. And I said, well, no, it's not true. I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I just, I'm, I learned how to play a little French horn, but I've forgotten it. I said, what do you do? What the hell are you doing here? I said, well, I play the piano. He said, I got seven piano players already. I don't need them all. And I said, well, give me a job. So they gave me a job. When the band marched by, I banged the cymbals. I always bang them on the wrong note. Anyway, oh say, can you bang C? But uh, that was it, it made him happy. I did nothing, virtually nothing. I went to chow, went to the movies, had a great time. Ruth and her mother decided to come and visit me because uh, Ruth said to herself, you know, we're writing letters, he is nice, and maybe we can go. I'd like to go to Biloxi and see Justin. And I said, well, uh, that'd be great because I'm thinking, here comes Ruth all by herself 
and my little greedy eyes were thinking bad thoughts. So it turned out that Rose came as a chaperone. And she didn't quite ruin, she was nice and she was cute. We, we had fun. But the guy that ran the orchestra, for which I only played the cymbals, fell in love with her. He was about 40, which was ancient for us, because I was 20 at the time, not quite 21. And he liked her. He said to me, look, take off the whole time. They're going to be here how many days? I said, about four days. He says, I just gave you a furlough. But bring, bring that girl around to the barracks. I want to see her again because she was so nice. I says, I might marry that girl. He said, well, that's one of the reasons. Anyway, at the end of the four-day stay, I had to play in the band. He says, you got to play at least once. It was a silly parade, and they gave me these big cymbals, and I never came in on the right beat because Ruth and Rose were standing there watching me. I got nervous. And marching along, I got very nervous. This was a technically difficult job for me. And then I started to go, oh, say, bang, can you see? And that was the end of my career as a, a symbolist, and pretty much the end of my career, because I was discharged from that field. And the friends I made in the barracks disappeared day by day by day, until I was alone in the barracks of 20. And I was furious. I went to the colonel and said, Colonel, what is this? Everybody here has gone home but me. Uh, he said, look, I don't understand it, Sternberg, but go in that room there. It's where they keep the records. I'll get you over in the room and ask them if they have any information on your discharge. I go in the room, and he says, the, ca the guy in charge of the room said to me, what's your name? I said, Justin Sternberg. He says, how do you spell that? I said, what do you, spell what? I said, Justin, J-U-S-T-I-N, Sternberg, S-T-E-R-N-B-E-R-G. He says, that's a funny thing. It's a computer room. This was the rudimentary IBM computer. The entire room was a computer with cards moving and moving around. It was the first computer in history. And I said, he said, spell it again. I says, S-T-R, in the middle of my spelling, I said, God damn it. I said, do you have a pull, a pull car, they call it, for discharge of anyone by any chance named Steinberg? And he looks it up and says, yeah, I got a Justin K. Steinberg. I said, look, you found it. God bless you, a sergeant like this. Just give us a sergeant, I think. Now get me out of here. And uh, a few days later, I went to uh, Jersey where they formally uh, discharged me. I forget what they called Fort Dix. That's remembering 60 years almost. They discharged me. And, and the, interestingly enough, in the bed across me in Fort Dix was, was a, a friend of Shirley's who already was married to my, my, my brother. And um, his name was a cousin. His name was Murray Horowitz. We became friendly, and then we realized we're both from the same area and talking and everything like that. What, were you, what, were you, what are you doing here? And I hadn't met Murray. It was the strangest thing. He was an immense guy, very tall, and, and uh, evidently he had been in Normandy invasion and things like that, and he didn't have a lucky life. He got cancer in a few years after that, and uh, that was it. But I was discharged, and we... We planned our wedding, Ruth and I. The ironical part was I wasn't quite 21 years old. I was a month short of being 21. There's a law in New York State that doesn't exist anymore. It says you cannot be married in New York if you're a man without your mother's signature. And here I am, almost three years in the Army, feeling very masculine indeed. I said, my mommy has to sign a signature for this? I thought I was a man when I was 15. He said, look, fella, I didn't make up the law. To get a license at the License Bureau, my mother had to sign a special agreement. We were married uh, on June 21st, a week before my birthday on the 30th. Caress the street.
to me upon your name a T for two and two for T and E for you and you for me alone nobody near us to see or to hear us no friends or relations on a weekend vacation have it known, dear, that we, we own a telephone, dear. They will wake, and they will break, and you'll awake, and start to bake a sugar cake for me to take for all the boys to see. A boy for you and a girl for me. Can't you see how happy we will be? This was Vinnie Umans, a great song. The lyrics were knocked by everybody, and they were great. They're written by a little Jewish guy whose name I forget. Ruth always remembers it. We met the delicatessen about 10, 15 years ago, and I saw him and I went over to him and I said, You are. He said, nobody knows me anymore. He was so excited. You know, <laughs> you mean you recognize his face? His shape, his body. He, was, he worked with George Gershwin and wrote this song, the lyricist, on Gershwin's first hit, which was introduced, of course, by Al Jolson. Now, here's what it is. First, he thought he was writing a Jewish song. I've been away from you a long time. you so somehow I feel your love was real me you are the man the birds are singing in a song time the banjo strumming soft and low Al Joseph first said I know that you yearn for me too Swanee first hit, he was all of 21. Hmm. Wow. The, both the songwriter and George had never, someone has said in the book, had never been south of 14th Street, <laughs> no less. You know, Let alone the Swanee. <laughs> no less the Swanee River. You know? <laughs> uh, but it's a, it's a wonderful Americana song. Isn't it? Does this, this take sound too, you guys? Of course. See, I stole, I gotta confess, when my aunt S died, we ransacked through her stuff nobody else wanted to look at, and I stole a lot you of these pictures. On, you know you're on camera. <laughs> if I knew I was on camera, I'd smile while I was talking. <laughs> There's Uncle Lenny. I'll be darned. A dapper kid, these are real look professional shots. Yes. 
It was hard to get in a fight with Lenny, you know. That's why I said that. I never, I never had an argument with him about anything. This is Faithy and, and not, is that Morty? That's Morty. Who else could it be? Going down the married one person. The other guy. <laughs> oh, that's, uh, that's Paula and, uh, and Barry. Let's see. <laughs> Anyway, Barry whistled all the time when he was two and three years old. Aunt Lil wrote me that all the neighbors called her whistler's mother. <laughs> <laughs> he was good, too. Same ears. <laughs> they never left your head. Oh, what did you say? So I can't hear what these ears. Yeah, he looks like Rod Steiger on this. It is Rod Steiger. Okay, now, want another good hysterical song? A hysterical song? No, hysterical. Okay, what song is this? Okay, Rogers and Hart couldn't sell a song worth a damn. Dick Rogers was 21, couldn't find a good lyricist, and someone said, go up and meet Larry Hart. He's less than five feet tall, he drinks and smokes cigars, he's an impossible guy, but he's the greatest lyricist living. And he was an old man, he was 27, when Dick Rogers was 21. Where was he working? At a Jewish camp writing lyrics and doing this for shows and things like that. And he introduced himself, Dick Rogers, a patrician, whose father was a famous doctor. And they got together, and for his show at Columbia, he was graduating from, the show was called Garrett Gaze's. The 21-year-old and the 27-year-old lyricist wrote their first hit. And it went something like this. <laughs> to and fro, what a lyricist you know, <laughs> it's mighty fancy, on old Delancey, that's a street you know as the world, oh, they tell me what street, compared with Mott Street, in July, so they must have been South Street, street push cards, why, <laughs> gently glide, this is his rhyming, glide, ding boy, glide, ding boy, <laughs> Our city's wonders can never spoil the dreams of a boy and Goyle. Changing into into a dial of joy. And in that show, so you may not know. Song. That was the beginning of an amazing thing. Uh, uh, Arthur, Arthur, Uncle, Uncle Mar, Mar, and, and uh, S. S. Uh, Chaim Yonkel, I don't know who he was. Uncle, Uncle Bam ben. with the Hitler mustache. Uncle you know he was the first man to walk across the, the bridge he helped design, yeah, the Washington right, right. Bridge. That was he, he that's Aunt, this is Aunt Lee right He here. and about 50 architects. And and he, but he walked along the, just a wire, a, a 12 inch wire that he held on and walked across the bridge with one other crazy person. He was very um, quiet, but he was a rascal as far as... This look at Barry. Gersh. They're your boys, yeah, right? Yeah, Adam and Eric. Oh, that's me and Adam. Oh, is that fun? You were to take a picture of that. <laughs> My father adored him. He was the first grandchild. Sure, I was. He too. used to walk with him on the boardwalk, Who's and that? you know what Ricky called him? Pop Otto. You remember <laughs> that, Rick? Pop Otto. He flipped out. He never had a grandchild before, yeah. and he was so excited about it. You know, in the world to be a it's good medicine. As there's mm -hmm. Nat and Lily. Wow, that's a pretty picture. That dress alone is worth more than fifty bucks. He and Mar and my father played pinochle almost every night. Then when they left, he got involved with two priests that liked to play pinochle, and but he couldn't call them father. One was Mike, and the other was Harry, or something like that. So he says, I don't want to call you father because I'm not Catholic. So what do you want to call me? He says, I want to call you both Pop. 
So they enjoyed it. That was the most exciting thing, and they thought that was the funniest thing. Hi, Pop. Let's Pop. You, it's your turn. You, you got to. Who is this? Let's, this is Otto. You talking about Otto? Yeah. Called him Pop. <laughs> My parents had no no prejudice or line between them. You know, my mother said to me when I was seven, if I ever hear you use that word nigger, I'm going to turn you into piece, small pieces. I don't want to ever Good for her. hear that That's word. That's more unusual from back then. Too. Way boy was that unusual. Now, this is when my father, he was the president of the Jewish War Brothers in 1948. Uh, that is my little That's darling boss. cousin Naomi. Oh, yeah, Naomi, right. I know. Is she I cute? Know and I wonder who that picture. is. I've seen this picture before. Justin, yes, dear. these are your ears. All right, well, the, so I can hear yeah, the so better. How do they get on oh. her? Yeah, they're dressed like a girl. Who else is it? You don't think it's Justin? Nah, it's probably me. You think it is him? Uh, oh. I do. Oh, well, I can't miss these pictures. Mm. It's a nice picture. Not centered. Mermaid room, is that where we when we got married, Ruthie? Park Central Hotel. You're in the Park Central. <laughs> Ruth, who is this? Isn't that Adam? That looks That's like Adam. Adam. He was like Adam. the cutest baby. And he talked before he was six or seven months old. It was incredible. Uh, but he, he was a happy baby. Look at Adam. That's so cute. You should show Adam his picture. I should. I don't know what he's doing down there. That must be him, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. <laughs> look at this. This is so adorable. Oh, look at this. That's my father dancing with this girl. Look at this, Rudy, at Leon and Eddie's. That's me. That's not yo yo rest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, didn't you know she went around in those outfits? Yeah, Ruth would have danced with him at that time, but I got another. I picture him. Look at uh, him. He's happy. Oh, boy, does he look happy. That's funny. That is funny. <laughs> Look at the funny hat on Ruth. Oh, yeah. That, that was a, That's is a the whole mishpucha there. Boy, everybody and his brother. And there you are. And yeah. you do look like a lot of kites in some of these pictures. I remember I wore it walking down Broadway and a man stopping me and saying, I love the way you look in that hat. <laughs> <laughs> his ultimate love song, I think Dick Rogers, I can only play 60 or 70 of his songs. Up my ear is this. Now, and remember, poor, poor little uh, heart. Never had a girlfriend. Was suspected of being a little uh, fruity. Was uh, always frustrated by his relationship because he was five feet tall. And uh, he wrote this song. I took one look at you. That's all I meant to do And then my heart stood still Beautiful song, isn't it? It's pretty good. Simplicity. Oh, 
Something Rod Crusoe and Robinson Crusoe <laughs> is not so far from worldly cares as a blue eye far away. <laughs> I mean, it's it just incredible music and it's lost to me. Only old cockers like me can still play it 